Welcome to our third episode of After Hours. This is your host, Adam. It's been a few days, but this week, we have an interesting guest. Every Mackie here in Yuvai has taken or soon will take MEUSME, Computer Aided Design. Although it is well known for its early scheduled class towers, it is also the class that most of us first get in touch with CAD programs. CAD, CAM, FEA. Programs are a big part of a Mackie's life. But did you know that 170 was relatively a new class on our schedule? Or did you know that the software that we use in our classes, a priori, was also one of the first cost analysis softwares in the world? Join us today is a legendary professor, Michael Philpott, the man who teaches ME 170, also known as the a priori guy. He will take us through his career, going in depth of his time in a priori and his time here in U of I. Enjoy. Professor, can you give us a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, yeah. My, my name is Mike Philpott. I'm a, a neurosis professor in chemical science and engineering here at the University of Illinois. I've been working in the design field most of my life and uh, have enjoyed a, a great career. And in that, now I, I really just teach class, which is the fun thing. Uh, awesome. Uh, actually, Professor, I think the, the volume's a little bit uh, cranky. Like, I think that it, it could be the internet, but it should be fine. Uh, uh, yeah. You like maybe actually a little bit closer, or maybe the increase the volume. Okay, yeah, you're a little bit spotty too. So. Oh yeah, is the internet these days uh, in, yeah. in the area is not working too well. Awesome. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh, can you guys can you give us like a basically a little quick, you know, I think the first question is like, how did you know this career, and you know, when did you know this career is what basically what you wanted, being you know in research, doing engineering, mechanical engineering, yeah. Well, it took um, it took a few years, but <laughs> I started actually in pure mathematics. Well, oh, okay. I went to a I went to a boarding school, private boarding school in England, uh -huh. and it took a little while for me to sort of find the sort of things that I wanted to do. So I just went with what my faculty told me. So I headed off to university and did pure. <laughs> Only, you know, after about a year, I realized I did not really want to study the theory of mathematics. It was, you know, can you prove zero equals zero? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I decided to sort of drop that, which I was encouraged to do, uh, and went and worked for a couple of years. And mm -hmm. work, I realized that the things I did as a hobby was things I also like to do um, as a job. So I ended up actually in a garage working with cars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and ultimately decided to go back to university and study mechanical engineering, which is obviously a far better choice than pure mathematics. So you had your uh, mechanical engineering degree in uh, 1977. Was that was the mathematics part before that or? The mathematics was before that, yes. Wow. And that was also in university, but it was just, you just I stopped, did, go to work and... The mathematics, um, wow. I, just, I just studied it for a year. Uh -huh left and took a couple of years working and and then went back <clears throat> okay so uh I, I saw you in your uh in the website you you've, you've worked as the draftsman does that mean like you draw the engineering drawings and sorry uh, so you you're, you were working as a, a draftsman and was that mean like yes. you were like yeah yes. drawing the uh you know basically all the engineer drawings and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah i started um in the drawing office i worked mm -hmm. a couple of different companies uh, designing things on the drawing board um, in a machine tool company, Molins, mm -hmm. and, and then ultimately in the auto industry, I worked at British Leyland Technology, which was, mm -hmm. was sort of Land Rover, the group that encompassed Jaguar, Land Rover. That, that mm -hmm. So in the, uh, well, that was in the 80s, that was when, uh, well, that, that was when cars were still running on, on gas and pure gas back back then. So. Yeah, yeah. So the industry changed a lot think, since then. Like back then, when like when do you know you want to like, go to you know? Because most people, for mechanical engineer, we some of us we graduate, we don't necessarily go to graduate school. You know, so when was yeah. the moment you start realize I need to maybe learn more and take a deeper in depth of the this field and go to grad school, maybe get a master degree, maybe get a PhD degree. Um. So after I'd worked in industry for two or three years, mm -hmm. um. That's when I went back and did my PhD. I, I, I went straight through pretty well doing my master's degree, but then I worked at Molin's Machine Company as a design engineer for a couple of years, and then thought that I'd like to go back and basically 
get a little bit more um, understanding of the role of design and manufacturing, mm -hmm. I'm very interested having learned a lot about how to design things and how to make things mm -hmm. and how to better design things knowing how to make things. So that sort of relationship design for manufacture was something I was very interested in doing. So I went back and did a PhD. Mm -hmm. I fortuitously managed to get uh, funding from the auto industry it was in the area of robotics and automation, but mm. I mostly worked in at the university in design for manufacture as a sort of um, teaching at the same time as doing my um, my research. So the two things sort of went together. Mm, okay. So yeah, because I was very like surprised to see you have you have basically the the timeline kind of overlap when you're working in the industry and we while you're doing the research. It seems like how do you have time to do both of these? Well, the system's a little bit different in yeah. the UK in that you typically would do a PhD while you were at university, mm -hmm. and you'd go back and do classes and programs. But, you know, so it took seven or eight years for the time I was done. Yeah. But over that period of time, I was working at the company that I was doing the research with, uh, uh, British Leyland. So it was very easy to sort of do the, do two things at once because a bit of a gray area which was my research and which was my phd versus what the company wanted me to do which was more or less the same thing <laughs> yes yes absolutely yeah so uh can you talk a little bit more about the uh the, the two university because you know most people watching this right now we're in u of i or we're about to go to u of i and probably none of them know what the uk system is like especially if you know for higher education yeah, it's it's changed more and become a little bit more like the American system now. But mm -hmm. back then, in those days, um, it, as I say, it was it was more common to do you know, a first degree in a rather specific subject and then mm -hmm. a master's degree again in a specific subject. Whereas mechanical engineering is fairly unusual to just do mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. which I did do. But then my master's degree wasn't in mechanical engineering. Mm. It was actually in design of machine systems. So it was a sort of, um, you tended to, to do your classes and your research in a, in an area that several other people were doing, and it was a complete program. So the mm. program I studied in was a design program. And then similarly, when I did my PhD, I was with, with other like-minded people um, but it's working in design for manufacture and automation. Very interesting. Uh, the one thing I did realize, I was looking, I was searching the uh, Greenfield in Institute of Technology. It, it appears to be the only university that does not give any undergrad degree, only gives master yeah. degree and graduate yeah. degree. And what, what was that like? Um, it was, as, as you say, the, it's the only university in, in Europe. And it had a great reputation because it only did graduate programs, so it was very focused on the research side of things. Um, I don't think it missed out, other than the fact that everybody that came to Cranfield was from somewhere else. Yes. So, you know, at the U of I, you've got a lot of people, mm -hmm. the majority of people did the first degree at the U of I. So in a sense, it was rather nice that everybody was sort of came into the graduate school and new to the area. It's a little bit like Illinois, Cranfield's mm -hmm. in the middle of the country in a very flat, mm -hmm. boring part of the country. Um, so not a lot else to do. Uh, so you focus on your work. And uh, yeah, Illinois is sort of a little bit similar. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I guess we can go even more in, in back. So like, when do you grow up, basically, you know, before, before a high a college? Uh, when did you realize like, well, engineering or math or you know, STEM is what you wanted? grew up in the UK and the experience of that. Right. So I didn't realize that's what I wanted for rather a long time because mm -hmm. until I was like 18 or 19, I was I, I spent a lot of time enjoying building things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I took the engine out of an old beta car when I was about 15 uh, using my oak tree in the backyard mm -hmm. and rebuilt the engine mm -hmm. with my but he just drove down to the south of France and it actually made it there and back, it's burning a bit of oil, but it did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I guess I knew that I liked designing, building things, and because mm -hmm. I was always sort of making changes to it and putting interesting lights and stuff on it um, <clears throat> at a fairly young age, but I didn't associate the two. <laughs> 
with my career, weirdly enough. So uh, I went to pure mathematics. I was sort of like, what do I do with pure mathematics? And as it took getting a job, actually working in a garage and working with cars, mm -hmm. that I realized that, yeah, mechanical engineering was something that was a, an actual program I could go and study. And uh, I thought it was just being a mechanic, but mm -hmm. I should probably do a little bit, a little bit more than that. <laughs> so when you were seeing about, you know, like doing, you're, you're very interested in designing, uh, and I know that UK has a very rich uh, motorsport history. And uh, were, were you ever considered, you know, were you determined to like, I'm going to do like manufacturing or you're, were you just like actually exploring which part of the design you want to do, you know, maybe motorsport or maybe just normal vehicle design? The motorsport side of it wasn't a big, big part of it for me. Although mm -hmm. I, I did, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, did have a, a motorcycle at Brands Hatch mm -hmm. and I look I ran it and fixed it and mm -hmm. stood in the pits for him and so forth, which was fun. Mm -hmm. But um it wasn't really that side of things. It's actually I got more interested in design and manufacturing working in the machine tool industry mm -hmm. as a design engineer at Molas, where I designed high speed packaging equipment actually mm -hmm. as, as the machine tool. And really um that's where I piqued my interest in design. And then I got involved in Cranfield in the product engineering center mm. and the sort of the link between sort of consumer products, competitive products was more there then than it was directly related to cars. Mm. Okay. As, as I have been teaching over the my focus has been more, even though I run the car teams, mm -hmm. um, yeah. my focus has been more in design, design for manufacturing. Mm. Yes. So uh, after uh, your PhD, uh, what basically was, was, can you walk through, yeah, after PhD to, you know, your current job here, you know, from UK to the US, like what, what happened in between over a long, this, a long period of time? So how, how did I get to be working in Illinois? But, yes, yes. So actually working at Cranfield, mm -hmm. um, I, I continued teaching at Cranfield after I finished my PhD. And we had various faculty from the University of Wisconsin come and visit. Okay. It was part of a sabbatical exchange program. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate to be invited to exchange with somebody at the University of Wisconsin for a year. So with my family, I had three years by them. We came over uh, to Wisconsin in Madison and stayed there for a year. And I taught mm -hmm. in the mechanical engineering department at the University of Wisconsin for a year. And I really did not expect to want to live in America, <laughs> but um, the kids loved it. And mm -hmm. so we, yeah, I interviewed a few places and, and Dick DeVore and Shiv Kapoor here in Illinois yeah. persuaded me to join Illinois. So I ended up down in Illinois. Well, it's purely because your family was like really enjoying the, uh, the Midwest here. Yeah, actually, yeah, it was more because wow. I was I was a little bit ambivalent to, to some extent. <laughs> I had you know opportunities there, yes. the field, and and I could teach pretty well anywhere. Yeah. So, so it wasn't I wasn't too concerned, but they were having a great time, and uh, I think it's more fun as a young kid to be uh -huh. in America than in England. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um. So uh. Yeah. So everyone in the department, all the students know know your know your software uh, a priori can you walk us through like when did you thought of this idea like the process of you know designing this idea and you know organizing the team the, the whole process the big picture yeah so it was really when i started here back in 1990 um mm -hmm. i started by developing what is now me270 the design for mm -hmm. manufacture program we really didn't have anything here that uh, other than manufacturing analysis class Mm -hmm. or any 285 which was the required class in manufacturing we didn't have anything that linked the two together you thought you mm -hmm. had to design something for economic manufacture and i had been studying that at cranfield and that is actually why they the department employed me was to help sort of bring that up to speed so i spent the first couple of years developing that program um but my heart i have to say was more on the design side than the manufacturing side mm -hmm. so the flavor of the class was very design oriented, yes. which, which it still is today. Uh, but during that time, we, we still used to some extent a drawing board, the early time at least, and we only just started using CAD. Yes. So as CAD came into place, 
um, I was suddenly realized that 3D CAD solid modeling had an opportunity that previous versions of CAD really didn't have, that the full math model, if you like, the full description of a part was actually there in the system as you were creating it. Mm -hmm. And really the first system that could possibly make use of that I think, was, uh, was then ProE, Pro Engineer. Mm -hmm. I bought the first seat of that in uh, 1992, shortly after they released it. The Caterpillar and John Deere had started using, and it was the first 3D CAD system mm -hmm. and being used in the state of Illinois. I started talking to John Deere about being able to capture manufacturing information while students and mm -hmm. staff, while employee, uh, employees were designing. And, and that was really fairly 93, 94. I, I think 94, I had my first graduate student working mm -hmm. on trying to pervase, basically provide a manufacturing button to mm -hmm. um, ProE, which we did do um, and created our first module, which was sheet metal. Okay. Round about 95, 96, which actually used at John Deere uh, back in 1996. That uh, you clicked on this button, it told you how much it would cost to make. And that was the mm -hmm. beginnings of uh, a priori. Yes. So that was at the same time, was were you like the first group of people that had this basically thought like, you know, combining manufacturing information to the CAD or like were other people also developing at the time? Well, there, were, there were lots of other people that working mm -hmm. in this area. Um, we, we used to use sort of charts and a lot of data about manufacturing expressed in graphs and charts mm -hmm. to help designers. And I put together a lot of uh, manual um, data lookup tables and things mm -hmm. like that so that you could do this thing. So cost estimating as well as manufacturability analysis you know, using that sort of technology. But everybody, I think, working in the field knew that um, the way to go would be to get this data automatically out of the CAD yes. system. It was not like it was an epiphany. Well, that's a cool idea. Um, that's what everybody wanted to do. We just didn't yes. have the means to do it until really a feature-based um, CAD modeler came along that we really had everything expressed in that way. And actually, the only thing it had expressed in that way was sheet metal for some reason, because of the mm -hmm. way it's a sort of flat, simple form. Yes. Um, that was the easy one. <clears throat> and then over the several years of funding from John Deere and National Science Foundation, our manufacturing research center here in Illinois, I managed to uh, get some funding from them and graduate students. By the time we got to sort of 2002, 2003, we'd developed quite a lot of modules that mm -hmm. really showed that it, it could be used. And John Deere were using some of those injection molding, sheet metal, some early uh, machining. Mm -hmm. um, and they started to be able to use it a little bit more completely in their drawing offices and their design offices. But my graduate students weren't really able to um, debug it all the time. So <laughs> they said, well, what are we going to do? You know, you're going to let somebody else take it on board, a company or whatever. And mm -hmm. so I started looking into getting funding and actually was approached by a venture capital company. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who it was, Polaris, I think it was as part of it, just going around the university looking for opportunities. And that's when I first heard about venture companies and didn't really know how they operated, but they sort of explained. And so I, I mentioned it to one of my previous graduate students who was one of the people that started working on it back in 96, mm -hmm. um, Eric Hiller. And he was now at Ford. Uh -huh. And Ford had sent him to Harvard to do an MBA. Yes. And so I chatted to him on the phone one day and I said, look, the venture capitalist people seem to think I have to have a business plan. Can you help me do that? Yes. He said, oh, yeah, we have a class in it next year. I have to do, um, I have to put a team together and we have to write a business plan. So I said, well, how about doing it for this? And of course, he knew the product well. He'd worked mm -hmm. on it. So he was keen. He was happy to do that. He got a couple of other Harvard MBA students to help him. <laughs> Yes. They wrote a business plan and actually entered it in the 2003 Harvard Business Plan Competition. Wow. And we won, which was a bit cool. Wow. Yes. When you win the Harvard Business Plan Competition, yes. all of a sudden venture capitalists are calling you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, of course. Yeah, that's wow. 
that's amazing the, the the whole process so so you really went through a uh, uh so it was originally founded by a uh, caterpillar and then uh, john, it, deere. john deere john deere yeah and then and then they stopped they basically stopped funding it and then and then you have to look for basically yourself try to sell funding and look for people who invest on this and then that's when people start it, focusing on this idea of wow this is actually going to work and it didn't really stop funding it so much uh -huh. it encouraged us or me to take it further and rather oh, okay. they, they funded it every year through one yes. of the programs and they were happy to do that mm -hmm. but it wasn't really doing what they really wanted it to do they wanted mm -hmm. to be able to have people use it and not yes. have the bugs in the software so they really okay. want, wanted it commercialized yes 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 and wow. It really didn't make sense for us to be trying to do it with a bunch of grad students all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was either sort of sell the idea to some mm -hmm. or do it myself. And to some extent, I like the idea of doing it myself. Yes. Um, but not necessarily writing all the lines of code. Yeah. Um, so I needed to get money in order to employ mm -hmm. a bunch of people. Yes. And of course, one way of doing that is getting venture capital money. Now, yes. a lot of people don't like venture capitalists because they give you a lot of money, but they take a lot of your company away from yes. you. That's true. Uh, but I went for that. I, you know, I was more interested in getting a product out the door yes. um, than I was about the money side of things. Mm -hmm. And so we managed to get Bain Capital, uh, Mitt Romney's lot in Britain, um, uh, over in Boston to fund it, uh, mm -hmm. together with another company, Sigma Partners. And the two venture capitalists, it was that four and a half million of funding in the first year. And we had to end up, we had to have the uh, software team in Boston, which was actually mm. a good idea because a lot of the good people, mostly from Russia, mm. um, work in Boston. Uh, the cat companies then uh, were all in Boston. Mm. Certainly parametric technologies, the ProE, as well as um, SolidWorks, which started at that point. And they had a lot of their geometricians from Russia. So um, they had the right people in the right place for the money. So we mm. started it up in Boston. And, uh, and uh, set over the years, more and more funding from venture capitalists. We're still funded by venture capitalists, still a private company. We haven't, wow. we haven't IPO'd or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or um, well, we, yeah, we, we involved other companies like Autodesk, for example, yes. as a slice of us. Um, but we, we're getting there to an exit strategy, I guess, sometime yes. in the next few years. Yeah, wow. So this thing is well, a priori is still developing and keep on growing as of right now, and it's still not IPO yet. It's, still, uh, it's a very, I say, a complex product. Mm -hmm. um, lots of companies around the world use it, and we gather data in the process and build on it. So it's mm -hmm. a developing beast, if you like. Um, we have companies all around the world use it, and we have offices all around the world supporting it. Well, so it requires a lot of employees. Yes. Yeah, that, that's one part I was wondering because uh, to make sure that this the, the APR is, is ahead of, a, you know, it, like basically provides real time data, it definitely requires like, how do you how do you collect these data across the world? Because, you know, so many things can influence the, uh, the cost happening and yeah. so many other small factors is it happen. Like, how do you collect the data, analyze the data and then putting it in, in, in a real I uh, will say quick response time. Yeah, and, and keeping it up to date. Yeah, keeping it up to date. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. So that is a big chunk of, of what we offer companies is mm -hmm. up to date data, manufacturing data, everything from overhead rates of sort of typical machines to mm -hmm. labor rates, of course, all around the world. Um, all that data and gathering that data has been a big chunk of what we do. Mm -hmm. As far as gathering it, because we use companies our software we actually do have their data um, mm. we can't use their data individually but um, part of our process is that we can at least use aggregate data mm -hmm. so we have permission from the companies to use aggregate data we combine all that data together and so we can by having a lot of companies use it we have average labor rates for example mm. and average overhead rates that then other companies sort of realize that they're above average or below average uh -huh. But also can make decisions, make by decisions, which is a lot of what it's about. Should they should they make it in house? Should they make it in house in Mexico, mm -hmm. or over in China, or should they send it out to somebody else to make? And, and yes. a lot of that can be achieved. Obviously, those decisions are using a priori. They can 
chess check out those different facilities, which is a priori supports the virtual production environment or VPDs. So I guess, Professor, that's where your uh, earlier mathematician career comes in and helps to play, or your knowledge from the math. Well, uh, you know, well yeah. certainly, uh, there's a there's a lot of complex mathematics in a priori. Actually, most of it's in geometry, which is not my area. Um, but fortunately, we have a lot of very good geometricians that do some fantastic stuff. A lot of you know our patents are in the area of feature extraction. So being able to recognize from a part that it has bends, for example, that's a sheet metal mm -hmm. part, versus that it has what the properties and parameters of those features are within it, mm -hmm. and, and how you would make it. And all of that has to be deduced by working out the geometry that's going on behind the scenes. So it's very uh, intensive mathematically in the geometry field. Yeah. So, uh, Professor, when you started a priori, it was only used on Pro E, or uh, uh, later I think it became Creo, yeah. or yeah. So, uh, but then you know, as years comes by, more and more cutting software exists on the on the market. And uh, how did you guys basically make a priori uh, sort of like you know, functioning across all the uh, different softwares? So we we use a, a general purpose interface that integrates with all CAD systems around mm -hmm. today. So we realized that we really need to develop our own geometry engine, basically, mm -hmm. that we could read other people's CAD models, convert it internally, and then display it on a screen, and then display the parameters on the screen, such as in you know, a metal part, the bends and the length of the bend and what type of bend it is, could mm -hmm. be displayed on its own CAD screen. You, you can't, uh, you've used a very, so you, know, you can't actually change the CAD geometry, but you can investigate the CAD geometry. Yes. And that's our own system. Um, well, we use some third party software to help, mm -hmm. but we don't rely now. We used to, everything we used to be done in Pro-E, but now we don't rely on the CAD modeler itself. We do everything in our own CAD okay. system, which took a long time to develop. So the first mm -hmm. 10 years of our life, we're basically doing that. And that's yeah. why we can get a lot of funding mm -hmm. to get up and running and develop the sort of what is now a very big, uh, broad system yeah. that can do pretty well anything. Okay. Well, wow. that's, uh, yeah, thank you for going in depth of the uh, A priori because, you know, most of uh, us, you know, in U of I students, we were just, we, we always know your legendary story of A priori, but we never really know the details of it. So, very thank you to, you know, to clarify that part and give us an analysis through it. Yeah. So, uh, aside of A priori, uh, let's get, get into, uh, uh, I guess I mean one seventy. I think that's the first class I take. I saw you as the uh, you know the uh, the professor giving the lecture. Uh, it, it 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 it. I guess like for everyone in U of I for Mackie students that you know it is is one of the classes we love the most. But at the same time, it's one of the classes like is is notorious because it's always eight a.m. Everyone have to be there at eight a.m. and uh, and you, for college students usually you know sometimes it's a struggle. So. How, are you? I, I I assume you're a morning person. You know, is is that has that been always that that way or uh, yeah? I am a morning person, true, and it's always been that way. Um, but I don't actually really particularly like teaching at eight o'clock in the morning um, <laughs> because it's all a bit of a rush and a panic to get in yes. and getting set up and yes. so forth, and the doors aren't open yet, and the lecture rooms and so forth. Um, but my eight o'clock has nothing to do with me. It was mm -hmm. because it was actually the last required class to be put in the program. Mm -hmm. And you may not appreciate this, but there are a ton of required classes yes. that these students have to take and trying to fit time slots yes. that don't conflict with other required classes, not just Mexi classes, but classes that Mexi students have to take. Yes. It's a real challenge. <laughs> and so the early morning, eight o'clock was about all that was left. So that's where it's ended up being. And if you try to change it, it messes with everything. So yeah, that's true. We'll know that all our required classes are at the same time, the yeah. same days of the week. And it's a sort of web of classes. Yeah. So that was the way it was. And the yeah. only reason that it was the last of the required classes that used to be in the yeah. TV CAD modeling world by general engineering. And when we went 3D, we didn't want to go 3D, but all our students were working at Deere and Caterpillar and Ford and using 3D. So we took it on board and I started teaching it oh, only about 12 years ago. Wow. 
And because we started a new program, new class, um, it was uh, suddenly became our own required class. Yeah. Required yeah. class. Well, yeah. Well, and I think now the students will understand why it has to be 8 a.m. And yeah. you know, everyone will stop complaining about it now. Well, so over the last year uh, since pandemic happened, how does that influence your uh, your job, your research and until now? Well, my job teaching mostly is my job. Um, yeah, we've changed quite a few things, of course, and the students have had to handle a lot of those changes just like we have. So it's been a bit of a challenge. But it was so perhaps fortuitous that I happened to be wanting to change over to um, Autodesk Fusion. We as a department had, yes. we, we had sort of realized that Creo had become, what was Prairie now Creo, become a bit of an old stale beast. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were newer technologies that we should probably lead. And so we had made the decision before mm -hmm. uh, the actual pandemic hit that we would switch, but it did mean that I had to sort of get in there and do it over that first summer, last summer. Mm -hmm. um, but it meant that at the same time, we all of a sudden had a fantastic platform, which yes. provided collaborative experience because that's true. One of the things we went, we, we went for Fusion was because it has, it has a cloud and the cloud base yes. yes. has enabled us to really work rather well within our teams across different countries and different places in the world. So by the time we started in the fall, we had a system that actually worked really well. Um, and it has, it's been pretty uh, seamless in many ways. Once we had got Autodesk's Fusion going, that, that all the students from China and India and here could work on design teams collaboratively, uh, didn't have to meet physically, could yes. do it all with all the work appearing in the cloud. But that's been fantastic. And uh, we were going to do that anyway, but it happened to coincide. Yes. Um, on yeah. the research side, I was involved in the ventilator project, Rapid Vent, and used my CAD knowledge there to, to help develop the, uh, the ventilator, the emergency ventilator, mm -hmm. and decided to work on back in the spring break, back March. And that was a fantastic experience. So many really bright, capable people working together to get an emergency ventilator working in a week or two. Um, yes. It's pretty cool to be part of. Mm -hmm. So there are some silver linings to have uh, not a great experience for everybody all the time, but we get that. And I think the students have handled it amazingly well, certainly in my classes and even our car teams, extracurricular activities have carried on and they've worked in ESPL and mm -hmm. in building their cars this last semester. And yeah, I think people have just coped, which is great. That's yeah, that, that's great to hear. Yeah. And, and certainly, yeah, Autodex, the, the cloud feature, well, I was using it for my senior project. And uh, I, I found I realized that the it basically they use cloud computing and it, it doesn't require all the students to have a very powerful laptop, which is yeah. actually very helpful. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, uh, so some people from some exact board uh, member from ASME want to ask you about I guess it's a little bit a broad question. What kind of advice would you give to your to your younger self? Any any time, any any kind of advice. Oh, I think for me the most important thing I learned very very quickly was to do something you enjoy doing. I spent yes. too many years in the early years um, trying to find something that would earn me money or mm -hmm. you know get me a respectable career <clears throat> um, instead of focusing on what I knew I enjoyed doing. So that's what I would do is try and find something. And most people, I think, have some sort of hobby or activity they yes. do. They already know that they like to do. Yeah, yeah that's that's definitely great. I think, yeah, interest is definitely the best motivation to to yeah. push through grinding and those stuff. Yeah. Um, so, Professor, out of your uh, teaching and uh, researching, uh, you, I guess you mentioned that previously when you were younger, you, you fix cars and you take away the, you know, assemble the cars, like for right now, what are some of your hobbies, you know, on the free time? So now I have, I've always loved building stuff. So uh -huh. um, my building has been more in uh, projects at home. Mm -hmm. I built okay. my, built my hot tub come swim pool yes. uh, last year. I'm building an elevator now for, a, we've got rather a lot of floors. Uh -huh. um, so I do sort of projects like that, but I also, um, I, I don't know if you know that I, I had a foundry for years and I still have my furnace. So I like casting metal. Sort of mm -hmm. um, 
I cast the uh, the large pans for the Urbana Courthouse clock, the four sets of pans, when we were refurbishing that as a department a few years oh, ago. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a fun sort of hobby project, Portman Mapple. Um, and my wife and I, we have large wolfhounds which we breed. So yes. that's another hobby that we do. And we have a couple of horses. We live out in the woods, so uh -huh. yeah, we can we can enjoy everything related to that. Yes, and and for now that you know we're working uh, as remotely at home, is it more enjoyable compared to you know go to have to drive to U of I every day or? Well, I have actually all the way through. I have done in-person teaching. Oh, okay. Yeah, for both both my classes, ME one seventy and the ME one ninety nine design project mm -hmm. class, have all been in person over this period of time. Wow. So I have been on campus a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So. Uh... Uh, and then just a couple of days ago, I was uh, watching some videos on designing and uh, this quickly, this this one new thing that comes to my mind is, is called, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard is this car called 21C, 21C Zinger. So it's, it's basically a, a hyper car that is completely designed by AI and is 3D manufactured. And it, it just it, it, it just blows my mind that because at the beginning when I you know signed up for mechanical engineering, I was like, I know the AI is going to take care of a lot of stuff in the future, but probably not a design perspective since, you know, it still requires sort of like, I don't know how to, de how to describe it, but, you know, this, this sort of like idea pops up in your brain. It's different. It's different from, you know, yeah, it's probably going to take time for them to, to learn and then do it until like, yeah, yesterday I saw this, this whole car completely designed by AI with some really, really complicated geometry shape that I don't think anyone will be able to come up with that unless you have like a very sophisticated, algorithm calculating and optimizing, you know, the, the FEA and all the stuff. Right. Where would you say, you know, the future of design is? Well, you know, gen I think what you're really describing, although there's AI part of it, I guess, the yeah. generative design, which is one of the modules of Autodesk now, mm -hmm. which a priori is a part of, mm -hmm. um, but also finite element analysis and other things is that you can basically sort of give Autodesk's fusion a beginnings of a design and it will finish it for you and then yes. it will find the optimum the, the, where to put the structure for the best most economic yes um both strength and mm -hmm. economics the cost so i think the ai sort of version of that uh, is essentially just building all the other pieces into it yes and it creates weird unmanufacturable shapes but mm -hmm. yeah with 3d printing and as we get 3d printing of course mm -hmm. we'll be able to make all those weird complex shapes yeah yeah so yeah would you say like you know one day in the future yeah. of design yeah like we're, are we going to be out of the job or are we going to be you know more more things going to be created out of that i think so and we'll just say what we want in descriptive terms yes to come up with a product for you <laughs> wow yeah so i guess my last question will be uh what, what what's life like you know living the uh, champagne urbana area just being you know you, you've been here since 1990 you've seen the uh, skyline rising in the in the campus what, what has champagne urbana has been you know over the past 30 years and uh, what is it like living here it's a it's a i think it's a very um sort of all-encompassing community it, it mm -hmm. embraces people from all sorts of walks of life and there's lots of little places around that you often don't see. We, we live um, in a wooded area right mm -hmm. near the Sagamon River, quite hilly, mm -hmm. which when you sit, you know, 12 hour drive out of there, or that 12 mile drive to work mm -hmm. um, is all it is, half hour drive. And I'm sort of across the flat countryside. Um, it, it's great for bringing up a family. My three kids mm -hmm. enjoyed growing up here and they spent their first few years of life in England. So it was yeah. a little bit different, but I think anywhere in the U.S. that is as, as similar to the U.K. is probably the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, culturally. So, yeah, I think it's a nice environment. It's, uh, it's not a lot to do here, but there yeah. are a lot of very nice. Yeah. Um, skyline's great. Lots of walking, lots of lots bikes. Of bicycle riding, all those things that you like to do. You enjoy the weather here? Yeah, the weather's actually not bad when you get used to it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And in, in the UK, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I asked this question for all the professors joining this uh, podcast as our last question. So what would be, what's your uh, favorite restaurants in uh, U of I? Favorite restaurants? Well, I'm a bit, I'm a little bit um, partial to seafood, so Red Lobster's. Mm. 
one I particularly like to go. And my wife and I usually go there if it's a birthday or something. Yes. Um, but you know, there are quite a few. Yeah, Chinese. I like Chinese. Mm -hmm. Indian food. Yes. In the UK, most people grow up with a lot of Indian food. Yes. Um, so I go to a couple of the Indian restaurants there. Well, yeah. I haven't been out to a restaurant in 12 months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, ho hopefully the pandemic will end yeah. soon. It's, it's getting there. So yeah, we can everyone can get back to the normal dining experience. Yeah. Weather has been nice. And yeah, I, yesterday I saw a lot of people were just walking the quad, enjoying their, their time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's getting there. It may be a few more months, but hopefully mm -hmm. the fall will be back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us, Professor. Yeah, it was it was definitely a lot of information. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. What an interesting talk. Grew up in the UK and now living in the US for almost 30 years, living in the woods in, in the Midwest, have a house with an elevator, a foundry, and many horses, started an industry-leading company, and still runs it like a boss. But at the same time, teach 8 a.m. classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I find it hard to describe Professor Philpott's path to such a unique combination of things. I can only say, what an adventure. I guess the greatest lesson that we all learn today is to be not afraid to follow your passion because that's your greatest motivation in this journey called life. Thank you for listening to After Hours. We'll see you next time.